I would like to welcome you to our prospective missionary fireside tonight. We're grateful for your attendance. We're excited for our evening. Um, we'd like to recognize the presence on the stage of, of several of our important guests. We're grateful to have Elder, Elder Christopher B. Monday, uh, who is our speaker today, and I'll give a, a more thorough introduction uh, to him in a, in a moment. We're grateful also to have um, President Lonnie B. Nally and Sister Kay Nally, the president of the Provo MTC. We're so grateful for their presence with us tonight. We're also grateful to have uh, Brent L. Topp, the dean of, the, um, of religious education for BYU and his dear wife, Wendy. Grateful to have Richard E. Bennett on the stand, who is the chair of the BYU Church History and Doctrine Department, and his dear wife, Patricia. Grateful to have my sweet wife, Tina, up on the stand also. Um, and grateful for our pianist, uh, Kevin Self, from the BYU School of Music, who uh, provided our prelude music. Um, and we'll give a little further introduction to others as we go forward tonight. Also in attendance in our audience, we have some special guests I'd like to recognize. Over in this area here, we have faculty who are teaching missionary preparation here at Brigham Young University as well as at Utah Valley University. We're also grateful to have members of the stake presidencies. In theory, all of your stake presidencies in Provo and Orem of the singles stakes are here um, to celebrate and to enjoy this with you. Um, we also have you, our special guests. In fact, we'd kind of like to get to know who we have here. So if I could ask those of you who have received mission calls already, to please stand. Take a look. All right, we'd like you to stay standing. Don't sit down yet. Those who have submitted their mission papers and are waiting for their calls, please stand. Here we go some more. All right, stay standing. Those who are planning on serving a mission in the next year, please stand. Oh my goodness. All right, last but not least, we're not done. Stay standing. Those who are here because you love missionary work or love a missionary <laughs> and are here to support them, please stand. All right. Thank you very much. You can be seated. So grateful to be here with you tonight. Our opening hymn tonight will be called to serve. It's on the back of your program. It will be led by Sister Chelsea Rencher, who has been called to the Spokane, Washington Mission, and accompanied by Kevin Self on the piano. After that, Sister Tiffany Blake, who has been called to the Kauaian Philippine Mission, will give our invocation.
Our dear, kind, and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to be here together tonight. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all of our many blessings and um, especially for the opportunity to, um, to be able to study here at this university and the opportunity that we have to be able to prepare for missionary work and to rejoice in such a glorious cause. Heavenly Father, we gather here tonight as valiant youth in these latter days um, for a very valiant cause. And we please add, and we ask that we may please have the spirit here with us tonight as we were instructed and taught. Um, we ask that we will be receptive to truths um, from thy spirit and from the instruction that we receive as well. Um, please help us to have our hearts and minds open um, that we'll be able to commune with thee. We love you so very much, Heavenly Father, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Before having the privilege of listening to Elder Monday, we will have the privilege of listening to a special musical number. Um, the musical number will be Savior, Redeemer of My Soul by Caitlin Duffy from the BYU School of Music and also one of my missionary preparation students. Caitlin will be accompanied by Kevin Self on the piano and Mary Nielsen on the violin. As soon as I'm done introducing Elder Monday, we'll have them come up and perform the musical number. We're so grateful to have Elder Monday here with us today. Uh, let me give you a little bit of information to help give you some background here. Elder Monday, Christopher B. Monday, was uh, named a member of the 70 of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, April 4th, 2009. Elder Monday holds a bachelor's degree in business studies and finance as well as a master's degree in MBA. Elder Monday has served in various and numerous church callings, including as a full-time missionary in the France Parish, Paris and La Réunion Mission Presidents, also as a mission president's counselor, a high counselor, a stake young men's president, a stake mission president, a bishop, a stake president's counselor, a stake president, and a mission president twice. Once in England, Birmingham, and once in Washington, Kennewick Missions. And just for the sheer joy of understanding it, Elder Monday's not even 50 yet. So, Elder Monday was born in Woking, Surrey, England. I probably didn't say that well. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> on December 23rd, 1964. He married Louise Cooper, Cooper in April 1985 in the London Temple. They are the parents of six children and four grandchildren and currently reside in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Now we're, we'll look forward to the musical number. After the musical number is finished, we'll invite Elder Monday to come up and address us. Thank you.
You know, I am not musical, but my wife is. And whenever I'm at a church meeting and I hear someone sing, I normally look at my wife and she tells me whether it's good or not. I can't actually see her. I don't know where she is. But I don't need to look at her tonight. That was beautiful. And I felt the spirit. I love the introduction. Now let me tell you who I really am. (laughs) And maybe this will set the stage. I was a young boy, adopted the second child, to a very humble family in England. My parents lived in what you would know to be the projects of England. We had nothing. The good news was that we didn't know we had nothing. My father never drove a new car. He never had new clothes. We didn't ask for much for Christmas because there was not much. And we were a humble, poor family. My father was an insurance agent. He was commission only. What does that mean? It means if he didn't sell, then we didn't eat. I was about 18 months old when the missionaries stopped my mom in a street in England. My mom says, and if she were here, she would tell the story, that the minute the missionaries stopped her, she knew that the gospel of Jesus Christ was true. She was excited for the missionaries to come to our home. Unfortunately, my father was not excited. My dad was a tough man. My dad was a smoker. He smoked between 40 and 80 cigarettes a day. When the missionaries came to our home, the missionaries were told to leave and go away. That was not what dad said, but we're in a church meeting. The missionaries left. And in fact, there's another sidebar to the story. They left and went to the other side of Gravesend. They didn't know where to go or what to do. One of them, a junior companion, said to the senior companion, let's knock one more door. They actually walked up and down a street. They prayed which door to knock. The door they happened to knock, a man opened the door. He was not supposed to to be there. Had his wife have opened the door, she probably would not have let them in. He let them in. He listened, and they joined the church. The significance of that story is twofold. One is that happened to have been my father-in-law who opened the door. The very day the missionaries were rejected at my home, They knocked on the door of my wife. But secondly, a great message for missionary work. With the scriptures promising that the Lord will go before us and be on our right hand and on our left and will bear us up and carry us, my father-in-law, if he were alive, he would stand here and testify that when he opened the door, he saw three of them and was surprised when he let them in that there were only two that entered the room. You are never alone as a missionary. My dad was the worst investigator that you will ever hear of. He was taught the lessons for six years. He smoked through every lesson. He burned out every missionary. Some of the things he said and did to the missionaries were terrible. He threatened to burn down the chapel. He would offer them tea and coffee every time they came to the home. He would take their bicycles on two occasions and drive them in the back of his car outside the pub so it looked like the missionaries were inside and drinking. And he would just destroy every single lesson. One missionary wrote in his journal, there is hope for every man. Maybe Brian Monday is the exception. No one ever thought that my dad would join the church. In fact, if I told you how my dad was baptized, you would be surprised because he went to watch a baptism. My mother was told to put two towels into the bag and dad was baptized there and then almost unexpectedly. 
And just so you know, my dad smoked cigarettes right up until he was baptized. But when he came out of the waters of baptism, and in those days was confirmed a member of the church, there and then, he never, ever smoked another cigarette again. My dad became a loving, caring man. My dad was a branch president after he had been a member of the church for little to no time. When I was a stake president in England, I released him as the bishop, he serving for his fourth time as a unit leader. The gospel of Jesus Christ changed my family. Let me tell you who I really am. I am a convert to the church. I am a young boy like you will knock on. I am in one of those families that will not progress and I will ever be grateful for the hundreds of missionaries that persevered with my family, not for a few days, not for a few months, but for six whole years. And sometimes I wonder what my life would have been like if I was not a member of the church and how grateful I am for missionaries and missionary work. And sometimes on your missions, you will not see the fruit of your labors. And sometimes you will wonder, am I doing any good? Am I making a difference? A few weeks ago, I was with Elder Gary Allen, who happened to be the companion of Elder David Lauper. Here sits Brother George Taylor, who was Brother Lauper's companion. Brother Lauper was a missionary in England, went home from his mission thinking that his mission had been worthless, that there had been no fruits and no good. Now I bring you some years forward, and I want you to think of my family. We have five sons, and then at the end, a daughter that is here tonight. Our fifth and last son is serving his mission. On the 17th of December, we'll be at the Salt Lake Airport, just like we've been before, and we'll hold the stands and the placards and we'll wave them as Jared comes down the stairs. Our first son served his mission in Colorado. Our second in South Africa. Our third in San Jose. Our fourth in New York. And now our fifth in Dallas. When Jared comes home and we count all of the years that our family has spent and served in the mission field, it is some 15 years years. And when I count up, and I won't tell you because it's irrelevant, how many people we have taught and baptized and seen come into the church, I want you to know that even though there may be a few thousand here, there would be more in that group than sit here today. And therefore, when you walk the dusty streets, and when you leave homes disappointed, and when you see golden families that you don't feel are progressing, and when you want to quit, and you want to stop, and you think maybe there's a Brian Monday, please think of me and think of my family, and think of the thousands of people that have been blessed because missionaries kept coming, and they kept teaching. It's a shallow missionary that really thinks his or her impact is measured today. You cannot measure the good you will do. You cannot measure the lives that you will change. And I will add my witness in this way. When I pass through the vow, there are many great people that I want to meet. Like you, I want to meet the prophet Joseph Smith. And like you, I have some other great people that I want to meet. I suggest that probably around those people will be lines and crowds and there will be a long wait. But probably where there will be no wait and where there will be no line are the missionaries for six years that continued to teach my family. I cannot wait to meet them. 
and to grab them and to say to them, thank you for what you did for us and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we talk of missionary work. And work comes before missionary. And Harold B. Lee said, we must learn to love the grind. And some of you will experience every emotion as a missionary. And if you believe that every door will open, it will not open. And you will see great disappointment. But I want you to know that God sees and measures differently. And if you look back in 30 years, you will have a very different perspective as to how you served your missions. And therefore, the way that you live, the way that you serve, the way that you give of yourself, the example that you set, the things that you say and do, the way that you honor your mission president, the obedience that you fulfill, they are the small things that make significant difference. My education is because I'm a member of the church. My career is because I'm a member of the church. My wife is because I'm a member of the church. How inspired a missionary was to knock one more door in another part of town. Every blessing I have is because I'm a member of the church. And now, in fact, we have five grandchildren. And we have two more on the way. And when Jared comes home, the next to serve in our family will be Christopher McKay Monday. And you'll see us again at the airport. And it's probably going to be in about 16 years' time. And that'll be the next generation that goes. And then after him will be Jacob. And then after him will be Cole. And we will continue to go out and serve and build the kingdom of God. And therefore, if Elder Lorpa was here today, and Elder Allen was here today, and we asked the question, was it worth stopping that lady with the pushchair or buggy? And now do you understand that rejection didn't mean no, it meant not yet. Was it worth it? And of course, the answer is yes. And then let me say this, that never forget as a missionary that you are being watched at every junction of your mission. And sometimes missionaries come into the field and they feel inadequate and they don't know what to say, and they don't know how to say things, and they worry that they don't know enough. And sometimes as missionaries, we feel maybe that we don't want to go. That may surprise some of you sisters. It was interesting when Jared, our last son, heard the announcement from President Monson dropping the missionary age down from 19 to 18. The sisters cheered and what a blessing it was that they could now go at 19. My son Jared gulped. I thought he was going to pass out. <laughs> In fact, a week before he left, he came to me and said, Dad, you're a member of the 70. Do you think there's any chance that President Monson would receive a revelation in the next week that young men don't have to go? And I said, number one, Jared, I'm not close enough to the prophet to know that, but I doubt that it's coming in the next seven days. <laughs> Our eldest son, Christopher, the night that he was due to go into the mission field, woke me up. I was a mission president and said, Dad, I can't go because I don't know enough. I sat on the landing with him in the mission home. I asked him if he knew the church was true he said that he did. I asked him if he knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. He said, I do. I said, son, you know enough. You can go. Our second son, Benjamin, turned 18 the day he went into the mission field. He was homesick for all of his mission. There's nothing wrong with being homesick. In fact, when I met a missionary who told me he wasn't homesick, I often wondered what kind of a home he came from because I wanted our children to miss our home. He cried in the shower for three months every morning because he didn't want his companions to see him. 
And then our third son, Samuel, who was six feet eight at the time and 290 pounds. And the night before he was going into the mission field, he opened the bedroom door and said, Dad, can I get into bed with you? <laughs> what do you say to someone that big? You say, what side would you like? <laughs> My wife got out all night. He shook, just shaking me as he cried himself to sleep. What a missionary he became in San Jose. And then our fourth son, Joshua, who as we drove him down to the MTC, as I said goodbye, turned to me and said, Dad, tell me one more time, is this true? And I said, Joshua, it's true. And he said, Dad, I believe you. And I think you're right. Now I will find out for myself. When he returned from New York two years later, he came down the escalator, grabbed his mum first, me second, and then he whispered into my ear, Dad, now I know for myself. So sometimes in the church, we do something because it's right, and then we really want to do it. And therefore, sometimes don't fear that you maybe are not excited. And there's a lot of pressure on young men, and sometimes you do something because it's right, and then you realize. You go because you have to. When you're there, you realize why you're there, and then you become. And when you become, you grow because you become as the Savior. And therefore, be mindful that you don't have to know everything. And you don't have to be a great scholar. Read, preach my gospel. Study the scriptures. Say your prayers. But above all, be clean and pure. Because you will never be able to preach the gospel unless you empty your backpack and take any rocks out of it that hold you back. But remember that your example is what will matter most. And you will teach first by who you are and what you are and what you do rather than by what you say. A number of years ago, I interviewed a sister for baptism. I was intrigued by her story. Her and her husband and two children were joining the church. I asked her how she had first connected with the church. She said that missionaries had knocked on her door years previously. She said that she never let them in. She said that they had knocked again and she still hadn't let them in. And then she said one day she was driving past McDonald's and she was in an area called Worcester. And as she was driving past, she saw two Latter-day Saint missionaries coming out of McDonald's. And she said that as she stopped at the traffic light and she saw the two missionaries coming out, that she noticed that as one of them unwrapped his burger, that the paper blew away. And she noticed that everywhere was paper on the ground. This was a littered, trashed area. And yet this missionary, seeing that he had lost his burger paper, and realizing that that was not right, decided to chase it down the street for a few yards, stamped it with his feet, quickly screwed up the paper, and put it into the trash can. She said that she turned to her husband and said, look at that, look at that. And her husband turned around and he said, what? And she said, did you see that? Look at all the trash and litter around. And yet that young man, because he dropped his trash, he went and he gathered it up. Think about that. She said to her husband, the next time the missionaries knock on my door, I'm going to let them in. It was three years later that they knocked. When they knocked, she said, come in. Because one missionary decided 
that despite all of the litter and all of the trash on the ground, that he needed to do the right thing and put his in the trash can. Think about that. And then think about this. A sister that was committed to be baptized. And she was driving home from a baptism. And she was him Wells that was part of our mission. And as she was driving home, it was late at night, and she saw two missionaries that she knew that had been teaching her the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were not in their missionary attire. And they were not in their missionary badges. And it was late at night. And she knew that missionaries needed to be home at 930 And they needed to be in bed by 10.30. And she could see that the missionaries were playing around. And they weren't doing anything terribly bad. But she knew that they weren't doing anything good. And the next day, she wrote a letter to the missionaries. And said that she no longer wanted to be baptized. Because they were asking her to keep commitments. But clearly, they themselves were not keeping theirs. How do I know that story? Because she joined the church 19 years later. Think about that. As a missionary, you are watched, you are listened to, and you're observed. I wish I knew who the missionaries were at McDonald's where one chased his rapper. I equally wish we knew who the missionaries were that maybe cost someone 19 years of their church membership. And therefore, as you go into the mission field, know that maybe you will not always be excited to go. Know that it will be a grind. Know that missionary work is work, and it's real work, and it's hard work. But also know that if all you have is a testimony and all you have is your personal conviction and if all you have is your own special witness and if all you bring is obedience and goodness and effort and you say to your president, President, I'm not the smartest and I'm not the best looking and I'm not the most eloquent but you can be sure that I am the most obedient and I will do exactly what you say, and I will follow the rules, I promise you that you'll have two things. One is peace, and that's an important part of missionary work. And then second, you will have success. And if there were time, and there isn't, I could tell you hundreds of stories. And I could tell you hundreds of stories of hundreds of missionaries. And I could tell you the missionaries that had the most impact, and they weren't always the best teachers. They were the missionaries that were obedient and had faith and paid the price and lived the gospel of Jesus Christ. And therefore I say to you, live the gospel of Jesus Christ and be clean and be pure and be worthy. And as you think about your mission now, think about this because it matters most. The days will come where your name will sit with the Savior's name. There has been no change to the missionary badge. Your name will sit with the Savior's name. Make sure that you never do anything where anyone would ever question whether your name and his should be associated and never do anything by which in any way you create shame or embarrassment that you're a Latter-day Saint. And if someone ever accuses you of being a missionary, I hope there's enough evidence to convict you. I hope that people see that you live as a missionary, that you act as a missionary, that you do as a missionary. And even in the mission field, there will be those that will pull you away And there will be those that will think the little things don't make a difference. 
And it doesn't matter if we get up a few minutes later. And it doesn't matter if we do some of these things. And sometimes to be obedient and righteous is not popular. It never has been. Ask the scriptures and go and talk to the Almas and Amuleks and look at the Nephites with his brothers and go through the scriptures and see those that stand for truth are often prosecuted and persecuted. And that is the way that it is. But as a missionary, you hold the line, you pay the price, and you be obedient. And then let me just share one final thought. When I would get those missionary papers, there were two things that really mattered to me on those applications. I didn't care where someone came from. I didn't care where they went to school. I didn't care what their parents did or didn't do. I looked at two things only on the application. One, I wanted to know who had saved for their mission. On the mission form, it would say who was paying. And it would say family. And it would say self. And I wanted to know who had really worked hard to be there. When I saw a missionary that had contributed to his own mission or her own mission, I knew that that was a different missionary. A missionary came into the mission field. His name was Elder Turner. He was a wonderful young man. I had been his stake president. I knew him. I felt sorry that he would be punished twice and be under my leadership. He came in and I looked at his missionary paper. And I looked and I saw that he had saved a hundred percent of his own missionary money. Now, I realize that for many of us, that is not the case. And I was shocked. And I said, Elder Turner, did you really save this money? And he said, President, I did. And I said, why? He said, you don't remember. And I said, I don't remember. Tell me. He said, do you remember when I was a little deacon? I said, of course I do. I'd been the stake president for 13 and a half years and on the presidency. And he said, do you remember about seven years ago asking me to stand in state conference? And I said, I do. This was a time where we had a shortage in our missionary fund. And I needed to ask the members of the Canterbury England stake to literally put money into the fund because we had blossomed in the number of missionaries serving. And I asked them by the following Tuesday to make a commitment so that we could put our fund back in order. And to illustrate the point that we were a growing stake, I asked six deacons to stand. Christian Turner was one of them. And as he stood, I said, brothers and sisters, these young men will be leaving to go on their missions in 2004. And then I looked at the young men and said, start working today and you save for your mission. And here I am now in 2004 and sitting in front of me is Elder Turner telling me, President, as a deacon I started working and I started saving and this is my mission. Do you think I ever needed to worry whether he was there for the right reason. And then the second thing I would look at was the photograph. You sisters, you don't have to be leaning against a barn or kicking your feet off of a horse. <laughs> you don't have to worry about the angle or the light. You young men, you wear the priesthood uniform, a white shirt, a tie, and the missionary attire. I've seen some interesting pictures. One day I'll print them. Deseret can give me all of the royalty. I've seen some of those pictures leaning against the haystack and legs kicking forward as if that would impress a mission president. When you present yourself to the first presidency and to the quorum of the 12, and then when you send to your mission president the first impression ever, let him and his wife see you as you want to be seen. And if I could look and see that a missionary paid towards their mission, and then I looked at a photograph where the hair was groomed and the missionary looked like he was ready, 
my wife and I would think what a tremendous blessing it is that literally we have the best of the best come into our mission. And therefore, I ask you just to think about that. Now I want to share something with you and just give you a thought that has been on my mind all day. I love the story of the martyrdom of Joseph Smith. There are some important lessons in the doctrine of that story for missionaries. You see, having been a mission president in Wales, I can relate to Captain Dan Jones. I've had the privilege of standing where he stood and literally reading to my missionaries some of the things that he said and taught. You can go read about him yourself. He was one of the greatest missionaries ever to have lived. In fact, when he preached the gospel, it was like a lion roaring. I love the story that in the afternoon of the 26th, the day before the martyrdom, we're told that he was asleep on the prophet's shoulder. And Joseph Smith asked him a very interesting question. And remember that Joseph had gone to Carthage and had made the statement that he was literally a lamb going to the slaughter. He knew that he was going to die. And imagine putting your head on the prophet's shoulder and imagine being asked this question to Dan Jones, are ye afraid to die? That's an interesting question. And I don't know what your answer would be, but his answer was very interesting. He said, engaged in such a cause, death does not have many terrors. In modern day language, no. This is the greatest work that anyone could be involved in. And I am not scared to die. Imagine his surprise when Joseph Smith prophesied, ye shall not die, but will yet see wells and serve the mission that has been appointed you. It was a few months that Dan Jones went off and literally preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. There were those that thought that if they slew the prophet Joseph, that they would kill Mormonism. The truth is that in Carthage, the next generation of growth was created because Joseph prophesied that Dan would yet go and preach the gospel, which he did. And read his stories. He baptized thousands and thousands. And I have been to those sites, and I have been where Wilford Woodruff preached the gospel, and I have stood at Gadfield Elm, and I have seen what happened to the United Brethren, and literally when they left, thousands wept because they had brought the truth to them. But what I also love about the story of the martyrdom is maybe more poignant, and that is that John Taylor had heard a song that he fell in love with while he was in England. The song that we know today as a poor wayfaring man of grief was known as The Stranger and His Friend. Interestingly, on the day of the martyrdom, because this was Joseph Smith's favorite song, he asked John Taylor not to sing it once, but to sing it twice. John Taylor sang it twice. I think of the emotion that filled the room and the spirit was there. There are seven verses in the hymn. The hymn is a classic in today's hymn book. But I want you to think of this as I share these two verses. I remind you of the story, the stranger and his friend. It was a man that somehow kept appearing. And the person didn't know who he was. And at different points he would appear and he would need help and he would need things from the person that he was appearing to. And the person, of course, would help him and succor him and strengthen him. And of course, we all know that in the end, it became very evident that he wasn't helping a nobody he was helping a somebody 
that was Jesus Christ. Imagine, however, the emotion in Carthage when I read these words. Verse 6, in prison I saw him next condemned to meet a traitor's doom at morn. The tide of lying tongues I stemmed and honored him mid shame and scorn. My friendship almost zeal to try. He asked if I for him would die. The flesh was weak. My blood ran chill. But my free spirit cried, I will. Imagine the emotion. Dan Jones, are you afraid to die? And then John Taylor singing a song. In prison I saw him next. Think of the relationship between an imprisoned savior and then an imprisoned Joseph Smith. But my free spirit cried, I will. And then this, then in a moment to my view, the stranger started from disguise. The tokens in his hands I knew. The Savior stood before my eyes. He spake, and my poor name he named. Of me thou hast not been ashamed. These deeds shall thy memorial be. Fear not, thou didst them unto me. It was five o'clock in the afternoon when between 150 and 200 people burst through the stairway and killed the prophet Joseph Smith. It was two months later that Dan Jones got on a long boat and went to preach the gospel in Wales. But what a question. Of me thou hast not been ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, said Paul, for it is the power of God under salvation. Missionaries need to be bold and preach. Never do anything that would show shame or bring shame. And never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will testify to you, in a world that is picking apart our religion, in a world that is testing the very doctrines that we hold dear, in a world that is challenging all of the things that we stand for, whether they be principles or virtues or literally lessons of life or morality itself, we do not need to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you need to trust my witness when I say, I have studied the life of the prophet Joseph. I have studied as much about his life as most other men or women could have studied. And there is nothing in his life that we should ever be ashamed of. And there is nothing in the history of the church that we need to steer away from or be ashamed of. There are things we may not understand. There are answers we maybe cannot give, but we have nothing to be ashamed of. And therefore, as a missionary, and as you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you stand tall and in humility and never arrogance. You show confidence. And when someone asks you, is it true that you believe this? Or is it true that you believe that? That you don't shy and you don't buckle and you don't apologize, but in love and firmness and goodness, you look them back and with tears maybe dwelling up, you simply say, yes, I believe that to be true. And therefore, as a missionary, make sure that you never do anything that would ever bring shame to you or to your life. Missionary work is a wonderful experience. Serving a mission will change your life. Serving a mission will shape you Serving a mission will humble you. It will teach you. 
it will train you. It will teach you how to work. It will teach you how to live. It will teach you discipline. It will teach you desire. It will teach you that even when the world turns against you, that you will have one friend that is forever true. You will learn to listen to the Spirit. You will learn to recognize His voice. You will learn to hear promptings. You will know when not to do something. And you will learn when to turn from something. But above all, you will learn about Him. And because you come to know Him, you will come to know you. And your eyes will open. And your spirit will enlarge. And you will realize who you really are and what you really are. And you will see the capacity that you have through serving him. And therefore, what does the gospel of Jesus Christ do? It enlarges us. It fulfills the potential of our spirit. And it makes us who we are. I could tell you story after story of a missionary who came out and I wondered if he or she would make it. And if I told you where they were today and what they're doing, you would be absolutely amazed for the Spirit has enlarged their capacity. And therefore I testify that missionary work is the greatest work. That missionary work is a cleansing work. That missionary work is a joyful work. And I promise you that as you go and as you serve and as you build the kingdom of God, that it will bring joy to your life. I testify that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. I testify that he is real, that his atonement is real, that his atonement removed the sin and the stain. I also testify that Satan attacks that doctrine, that Satan wants particularly the young people to feel bad about themselves and to worry constantly that they're not worthy or they're not ready or they're not able to serve. I will say this everywhere I go until it gets old or I get old. It is interesting to me in the creation of the body that Heavenly Father meant that our necks and our heads can only turn so far and our head and our feet face in the same direction. If Heavenly Father wanted us to constantly look back on our lives, he would have probably enabled our head to turn completely round. But instead, he wants us to look forward and to think forward. If you have repented, if you have paid the price, if you have put it behind you, then you should leave it alone. And don't be like the dog that returns to the vomit and let it go. I was a young stake president when I learned this lesson, a lesson I have never forgotten. I was in the Canterbury Chapel. I was sitting on the stand. There was three return missionaries that came in. I unfortunately had excommunicated one of them. However, he had subsequently been rebaptized and had his blessings restored. My memory is as good as anyone's. I can remember things and facts and dates and information, and I don't forget. When the three walked into the room, I remembered that I had excommunicated one of them, but I couldn't remember which one it was. And then I quickly did remember which one it was but I was trying to remember what I had excommunicated him for. During the opening hymn, I just pondered and was trying to remember. I thought I was having a senile moment. During the prayer, I still wanted to remember and I couldn't. The sacrament hymn was sung. The blessing of the bread was underway. I was the presiding authority. And as clear as you hear my words, I heard a voice and it said, Chris, if I have forgotten, what right do you have to remember? Let it go. I have never forgotten that instruction from heaven. 
I had seen a young man make a mistake. I had seen a young man come back. And to this day, even though I was the presiding officer, I could not tell you any facts about his situation because the atonement cleansed and the sin and the stain were removed. So I testify that you can be worthy and you can be clean. And you must never let despair and doom and discouragement destroy you. And if there's something in your life that isn't right, then fix it. If there's a few rocks in the backpack that need throwing out, throw them out. But I testify that you can be clean and pure. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ loves you. And he knows you. And just like the song, The Stranger and His Friend, the day will come where your eyes will open and you will see the Savior stand before your eyes. And when you look back on your life and see what you did and where he was, you will be amazed how much he was in the detail of your life. And therefore, I know him, I love him, I testify of him, and I testify that he knows and loves you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. How grateful I am to have been here tonight to hear the words of Elder Monday, the testimony of Jesus Christ. How grateful I am that you have come tonight. And I pray that you felt the spirit as I have. We're also grateful for Katie and Mary and Kevin for that beautiful musical number and, and grateful for the spirit that has been with us tonight. We'll close our meeting by singing the closing hymn, Hark All Ye Nations. It's on the back of your program. After which our closing prayer will be offered by Sam, uh, Sam Jacob who has been called to serve in the Baltic Mission.
our Father in heaven. We are truly grateful for this opportunity that we've had to gather here together tonight as prospective and future missionaries and to take comfort and joy in the fact that we too will be a part of this great work of building up thy kingdom. We are grateful for uh, Brother Monday and for his words and we pray that we will be able to truly apply them and let them help us prepare for our missions and become better saints and members of thy church. Bless us now that we'll be able to treasure up this spirit that we have felt here tonight and be able to return to our homes in safety and that we will truly have our testimony strengthened and have the courage to testify that thy gospel is true. Again, we are grateful for all of our very many blessings and we pray and close this meeting in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, amen.